Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Timo Stallenberg, and I, I will talk today about uh, doing continuous integration for Python projects. I've been involved with uh, doing Python, mainly web development, for more than 10 years. Uh, most of the time I spend for a project named Plone. Plone is an enterprise content management system built uh, on Python. It has a worldwide community uh, of more than 340 core developers. That makes us uh, among the top 2% of all open source projects worldwide. Um, Plone is used on several like high-profile websites like the uh, NASA, CIA, Oxfam. Uh, the Brazilian government is basically running all their sites on Plone. Uh, lots of uh, public um, institutions are using Plone. Universi a lot of universities in, in Germany are using Plone, for instance. And I've been involved with, uh, with developing Plone uh, as a core developer for more than f uh, five years now. And I'm the leader of the continuous integration and testing team um, of Plone. So I'm taking care of uh, all our testing and continuous integration needs. Uh, in the Plone community, we have used, we, we took testing pretty seriously right from the start. We have been pretty early adapters, uh, adopters of, of testing and test driven development. Um, test driven development is, is pretty deep into our, our culture. Uh, when we do sprints, we do like pair programming, test driven development, and stuff. So we have a comprehensive set of, um, uh, we, have a, we have a testing framework with a comprehensive set of uh, test fixtures and testing layers. Actually, we have, I think, three or four testing frameworks in, in the Plone core. With one we, we really want to use, and the other ones are just still there. We're trying, still trying to get rid of them. Uh, we have about 8,500 units and integration tests and around uh, 70 user acceptance tests. Um, um, Jenkins has been introduced into the Plone community around three years ago. Before that, we used a tool that was called, or is called, uh, BuildBot. It's a Python-based uh, continuous integration framework, so it's not really an out-of-the-box solution like Jenkins is, but it's a framework which you can use to, to build your CI system. So that means that if you want to like set it up, you need a couple of hours to first understand it, and then you can start to build your CI system before you can actually like doing CI, right? And then when, when Hudson back then was introduced, it was really like, for me it was like, wow, okay, this is like, we have, we, we have, we have been trying to use like BuildBot for a long time, and it was never really something that uh, was running continuously. And then like Jenkins came along, and it was really easy to set up like the first job, right? The only thing that we needed to do to integrate it into our like test runner and setup was uh, to write a, a thin layer uh, or thin um, addition to our uh, test runner that spits out a J unit, so that that Jenkins can process, right? This was it. Um, in order to uh, to set up an effective continuous integration system, there are like three things that you need. Uh, one is version control, the second one is an automated build and testing process, and the third one is agreement on the team, right? Because continuous integration is not really a tool, it's not like Jenkins or, or BuildBot or anything, it's like um, a process, a process um, that your team implements. So first, first thing is version control, as I said. Um, Andrew Bayer, who gave a talk earlier here, skipped the, his version control um, uh, slide <laughs> entirely because it's just version control, right? Um, you can you can think about it like that, but in terms of like continuous integration, it's it's a bit more complex than that because if you do a commit, uh, by default Jenkins will will pull your uh, your version control system for changes, like every five minutes or every maybe even w every minute. The problem with that is that you might get like multiple builds, uh, multiple commits in there, right? So at the end, you can't like really point uh, uh, your finger at a person and say, hey, you broke the build. You can point the fingers at two persons and say, hey, one of you broke the build, please fix it. That won't work, right? So it's really essential that you have one build per commit, um, which is, I think, best, best practice among, among the, uh, the Jenkins community. Um, so next question, when you did the commit is, uh, which 
project you actually build. Like in Plone, for instance, we have like two major releases, which we maintain, uh, and we have packages that are shared among both. Some are like separated in branches, but some are like shared between um, our two uh, releases. So for one commit to one of those uh, packages, we want to build like two or three or four um, builds, right? We have like we test against multiple Python ver versions. So if you if you trigger like two releases, then it's at least four builds because currently we're running against Python 2.6 and Python 2.7. Um, so that's not not really easy. Um, it's it's pretty dependent on your on your needs or on your project, right? Um, but you have to like implement it, right? Because you want to automate your your CI system. So what what we did because we are not really we are Python developers. We are not like really good at writing Java plugins, and it's like a high barrier for us. So we we wrote like kind of a middleware between like Jenkins and um, and GitHub, which is uh, what we are using for like version control, uh, that actually um, parses our sources files of our project and then decided which build. You, b which which project to build, right? I, I'm pretty sure you could like uh, implement that m in a more elegant way in in Jenkins itself, but it was easier for us to set it up uh, uh, I as a, as a middleware. Uh, this middleware is what's called Mr. Roboto, and it just sits in the middle and it does not really do a lot. And I and I still try to convince the other people that are involved that we should try to do most of our stuff in inside Jenkins so we can reuse all the uh, the plugins and everything and every single. Everything still works because the, a lot of other developers try to like get more stuff into Mr. Roboto because because just because it's Python, right? Um, but then you're not done. I mean, the next things are built. I will come to that in more detail in a minute. And then you yeah we have to uh, notify people, right? But uh, but if you want to notify people, you have to preserve the uh, commit message, right? If you have like a build pipeline and you have multiple jobs uh, and you run them in parallel, you still want to preserve the commit message. If you have like, if, if your build fails at the end of your build pipeline, then you still want to know who, who actually did it, right? So you have to preserve that information. So version control is not that easy. Um, second thing that you need, as I said, is an automated build. Um, that was actually pretty easy, or is pretty easy uh, in, in in Python or in the in the Plone community because we had like since a long time ago we had uh, a system called Buildout, which is basically something like Maven. It's a pretty sophisticated system that allows you to easily set up your development environment, but you can use it as well uh, to to set up your uh, your deployment. Like you just tell Buildout, hey, I'm, I'm now on a development environment, I want a development environment, or you can tell them, hey, I'm, I'm a front-end server uh, right now, so just set up the front-end part, or I'm a back-end server, or whatever. So you can spread um, your configuration across different servers, or you can set up your entire setup um, on, your, on your machine. Uh, it has been built, uh, I think, sometime before like all this pr those fancy provisioning tools have been around, but this is what we're using in the uh, Plone community, and there are a couple of other projects in the Python community that are al also using Buildout. Uh, you can use Django, uh, you can use Buildout in Django, for instance, uh, but most Python projects prefer a more lightweight approach, which is uh, these days pip or easy install. Um, they are basically just installers for PyP, which is our like C-SPAN central uh, package repository, and you can say just say pip install whatever package you want and it will install it and you can like keep a requirements file with all your dependency requirements but it's not as sophisticated as as build out um, other tools that are important if you want to build uh, python projects on on jenkins or anywhere are uh, virtual env to to create virtual environments for python and uh, tox which is a configuration um, file or configuration language to tell a CI server which, um, for instance, against which Python ver versions you want to build your stuff, right? Um, all those um, tools that I described are supported by the Shining Panda um, Jenkins plugin, which allows you basically to say, okay, I have a Jenkins um, um, project and uh, I have, a, like, just look at the Tox file and Tox will tell you that you have to build against Python 2.6, 7, 2.7, and Python 3.3. .3 and 
with those environment variables, right? So we can use everything that, that Python developers are used to or that also other CI systems can understand. You can integrate that into Jenkins. Uh, for the Plon community, we actually are not using any of those. Uh, we are not using the Shining Panda plugin. We're just using plain, plain jobs, just because like my experience was um, that when I do not desperately need a need a plugin, I try to avoid it just to to keep the the uh, the setup as simple as possible. The third uh, and most important uh, part of um, an effective CI system is agreement on the team. Uh, as you can see, here, this is a uh, a picture of uh, the the Plone conference in Brazil uh, last year, um, and we have like a vibrant and, and large community spread across all time zones, uh, across all continents. Uh, as I said, we have 340 core developers. Um, and um, if, if you have like a small uh, development group, right, and you're all sitting in the same office, it's easy to like have an ag agreement among those developers and say, okay, our CI system works like that or our CI process works like that and we all agree on that. Um, and you can actually force people to, to do that, right? If you're the boss, then you can say, hey, you will do that process. That's our process, right? In an open source project like Plone, you can't really do that, right? Because you can't say, hey, please, we have those rules. But if people don't care and they have like the, the permission to, uh, to, to commit, then they will commit. And in the Plone community, we have like uh, historically pretty open about like giving people access to our uh, our repository. Other projects handle that differently, but actually I like that a lot about the Plum community, that we're really open and we're trying to like get people in as soon as possible. And with an effective CI system, you can avoid like that people break builds, right? Uh, speaking about breaking builds, uh, when we set up like our CI system, when we had Jenkins in place and all our new shiny system, we were like really, hey, hooray, uh, we have this CI system, the build will be never broken, right? Uh, but what happened was that the build was actually broken like 100% of the time, almost. Um, because nobody really cared. Our Jenkins setup was like was not catching everything. It was not working reliably because our testing tests were like somehow not working reliably and stuff. Um, so what happened is the build was broken 100% of the time. And only when we did like a release, if we wanted to make a release, then like our release manager and maybe two or other two or three other really hardcore Plone developers went ahead and, and fixed all the broken tests and then at the end we, we had a release. So it took us, I don't know, uh, one or two weeks to do a release, which which really sucks. So it's it's not really enough to just set up a CI system and then say, hey, we have everything, right? So what you should do is First thing is to come up with a set of continuous integration uh, rules. There's this fantastic book uh, called Continuous Delivery, which probably most of, of you guys know about, from uh, Jess Humble and uh, David Fairley. And they basically have like eight rules uh, to, to, to implement a process, a CI process, an effective CI process. It's basically, I won't go through all the eight rules, but it basically it's, uh, it's uh, don't check in on a broken build to not make things more complicated, right? Uh, run tests before committing so you don't uh, break the build in the first place and revert immediately on failures. And the third one is, is really, really essential and really, really important. Uh, so far, we in the Plone community, we don't have a system that allows us to pre-test uh, things before going into the master branch like the system that Lars just uh, introduced. I would really like to have that, but we are not there yet. Um, so those rules really help us to at least tell people, hey, this is how you should behave, right? But it's not enough to just tell people how they should behave. It's, you still need an effective system to like point to the commit that broke the build, to point to actually the person who broke it, and things like that. So I will now go more into details how we implement our um, CI system and how we somehow enforce our continuous integration rules. Oh, by the way, if you, if you want to read them up, um, there's the, uh, the URL there, and I will upload my slides to SlideShare soon. Uh, but it's, it's basically just a, a, a rewrite of the, the rules from the continuous delivery um, book. So first thing that, that you do if you have like the commit, and if, if you did the commit, right, and, and you, you start the build, um, 
is, is testing. As I said before, we're using this thin layer to, to uh, make our tests, uh, our test runners spit out um, JUnit um, uh, output, so Jenkins can process it. It's called Collective XML uh, Test Report. You probably uh, don't want to use it if you're not a Plone developer. If you're a Python developer, you're even better off, um, because like tools like PyTest, which is, uh, I think, the most popular uh, testing, a framework amongst Python developers these, Python developers these days uh, is able to um, to spit out um, JUnit, so you can use it directly in in Jenkins. Uh, another thing that you might want is uh, is test coverage. There's uh, a, uh, a Python package called Coverage, which allows you to to generate coverage, and the Kubertura Jenkins plugin can process that. So you get those statistics that you probably all know about, like tests and uh, Test coverage. Um, one other thing that that we introduced, like I think two or three years ago as well, is automated acceptance tests. We're using a robot framework for that, and we're really happy with it. It's a robot framework is a generic um, test um, testing tool that allows you to specify acceptance tests in natural English or German or whatever language you want to use. Um, you can use behavior-driven development. Um, uh, style like uh, you can see uh, with this like real simple test case with given when then, but you're not forced to. And the good thing is that um, Robot Framework has uh, a Jenkins plugin which work works really nicely. So you can not only integrate the statistics, but also the reports that Jenk uh, that Robot Framework um, uh, gives you, which basically, um, uh, yeah. We're using, I mean, Robot Framework is, is a generic um, framework, and we're using the Selenium 2 plugin. So it's, it runs WebDriver uh, on, on your browser to, to like go to pages and, and do stuff and test it there. And if it fails, then it will do a screenshot, and this screenshot and a full report of your entire test can be integrated into, into um, Jenkins, which is quite nice. And uh, another nice plugin is, uh, or a nice um, service is uh, Source Labs. Uh, they they offer like cloud services to do those robot tests or those Selenium two tests on any kind of um, system or browser. So you can use like outdated Android. You can test an outdated Android devices. They have like just everything, right? Um, another thing that is that is quite important for like dynamically typed uh, languages like Python is is static code analysis. Not that it, it's not also important for Java, but I, I guess for Python it's even more important. Um, if you're a Python developer, you probably know know the tools for static code analysis, which are like Pep8, PyFlakes, uh, PyLint. Um, those are the tools that you are usually use. We created a an integration for those tools, not only for the Python tools, but also for like things like JSHint and everything that we use as a best practice within the Plone community is called Plone Recipe Code Analysis. It's a build-out um, recipe. The build-out system is this, this Maven-like thingy. Uh, so you probably don't want to use it if you're not using build-out, right? Um, the violations plugin of Jenkins can, can uh, process and show all those statistics, so the integration is also um, pretty nice. So if you do like your, your testing and your code analysis and uh, like your performance tests, uh, creating documentation and everything, at the end you still want to notify people, right? So I guess everybody is in the Jenkins community, at least that is my impression, is, is using the, the email X uh, plugin. We're, we're using that as well because it's really uh, cool to like being able to like configure, uh, configure the way you're writing emails because you don't want to like write too many emails to like a public list. You want you might want to write an email to the person who broke the build with like more details and stuff. Um, so we, we are using an LDAP, um, uh, the LDAP integration of Jenkins because we are, uh, all our users are in our LDAP database. And we're using the Jenkins dashboard plugin to like show to the users what, what builds we run, right? Um, the next thing, if you have like your CI system, your CI system in place and everything works, you 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 need to think about like scalability, right? Uh, as I said before, we have like multiple um, multiple releases at the same time. We have 300 over 300 packages that we want to test against different Python versions, and if we do releases, um, we're doing usually a lot of commits because you basically have to like check 
the, the change log of every package, make sure that it's like up to date, and then like do a release. Um, so we are doing a lot of commits, uh, and our build currently takes like over an hour to run. Um, so we 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 have to run builds in parallel, right? There's no way that we that we just like have only one build at a time. That just won't work for us because it will take ages. Um, so uh, one important thing, uh, which is like I guess also best practice among the, the Jenkins community is is that don't run anything on your master. Like have a set of slaves, run it there, uh, because you won't always want to have your be your, your master should be like responsive and everything, even though uh, all slots are taken. Uh, another really important thing is provisioning. Of course, you want your your slaves to be 100% identical. Uh, you will run into really serious problems if you if you set up anything on your slaves like manually or if you do things like hey uh, on this slave I can only run Python 2.6 and on this slave only Python 2.7 because then Jenkins cannot really spread um, jobs across the machines so uh, yeah we are using uh, for provisioning in the in the Plum community we, we used to use Fabric um, which is a Python tool and now we're using Ansible which is pretty comprehensive and pretty nice, but you can also use like Puppet or Chef or whatever. It's just important that you use a tool that's documented what you're doing and that you can easily like set up your set up new slaves in a virtual machine and just get rid of them if you don't need them and that they're all the same. Um, then you have to think about like parallelization, right? You want to, to run those jobs in parallel. So your your testing setup has to be uh, compliant to that. One thing that where we had a problem is that we run all kinds of different tests, not only unit tests, but also tests that have to open ports and actually do like browser testing. Not not specifically like robot tests, but we also have like a second browser testing framework that was there a long time before browsers could do JavaScript and long before like robot or Selenium or anything. Um, so if we run a build, then we have like multiple tests that op have to open ports. Um, and then the uh, port allocator plugin of Jenkins really comes in handy that you can just uh, tell the plugin, hey, give me like a number of, of ports and the tests are using them. Of course, your tests have to be like written in a way that they can use that, that you don't like uh, s uh, type in your, um, y the, the port that, that your tests are using um, directly into your test that you, you're getting the information from, from the port allocator plugin. Um, with scalability, they, they, they came a lot of problems uh, for us uh, when setting up Jenkins. I'm, I'm not like a Java developer. I'm not a hardcore uh, Jenkins developer or whatever. I'm just a user of Jenkins. And the last time I, I wrote Java code was at un university, and that's quite some years ago. Um, so uh, we ran into a couple of problems. Uh, basically, w one of our main problem is is like preserving the GitHub commis or commit messages or getting the GitHub commis commit messages inside Jenkins in the first place. Because as I said, we had we have like 300 packages, and uh, I I couldn't make the GitHub plugin or I could configure the GitHub plugin in a way that you that you trigger a build to Jenkins and the the uh, the um, repository that you're checking out is not the one where the commit came from, which is the case in, in, in Plone, because we have one main repository that fetches all the other ones, right? And if you commit to, to one of the other ones, it Jenkins will, will uh, um, check out the main one. So it was hard to get it in, and that was one of the reasons why we wrote this middleware, to get that in. But if you, if you have them the, uh, the git commit message in, then it's hard to preserve if you if you run uh, those jobs in parallel and on different slaves. I don't know what actually went wrong, and I and I never like really looked into the code. Um, but this these things work really fine if you have one repository, and then everything works. But if you like have to scale them, they don't really uh, work that that well any longer. And I guess the problem is also like having multiple like plugins in Jenkins that makes things uh, things a lot uh, more complicated. Um, so once we had our CI system in place and we had like a green build for like a maybe like 90% of the time, uh, we, we thought about like uh, making our release process better. It's still, even though we have a green build, when our uh, release manager does a release, he needs still a couple of days to do 
a release, and that really sucks, right? Um, so what we want to do, wha what we want to do is really, if you do a commit uh, and all tests pass, then it should be a releasable candidate, and our release manager should be able to just push a button, and uh, we're good to go, right? Um, but there, there are a lot of things that you need to do uh, if you want to uh, build a Python project like this. First uh, thing you, you need to do is like to create a release, like an egg release. Uh, and, and in Python, you're, we're shipping packages with, with a something called like eggs. Uh, so you want to automatic automatically uh, create releases. We have tools for that. One of the tools that we're using is called Zest Releaser. It can automatically make, make releases. Uh, that, that's really working fine. The problem is still that people commit and forget, for instance, to, uh, to amend the change log, right? And we still have to do that manually. So even though we, we are able to do like automatic releases, if we do a release, we still have to go through the commit messages and make sure they, uh, they amended the change log. So we can't like fully automate it. We can like automate it, automate it, but uh, we might end up with uh, with missing missing um, change log entries. Um, so if you do automated releases, um, you want you can test against those releases, right? If you want to test, then you should you you need a central place where you can upload those eggs. And there's uh, the DevP project, which came out of the PyTest um, project, which is basically a PyP mirror. Uh, and you can easily like uh, create those egg releases with Zest Releaser and then upload them to to DevP, right? And then test, uh, make your Jenkins run not really check out c any code, but only run against your eggs. And this is actually what you want to do, right? In the Plum community, what we're what we're doing right now is we're testing our development environment more or less. We're not testing our final releases, and we're about to like implement a solution where we actually test the egg releases that we are doing. And DevP can, can really help with that. Um, and also, of course, we are using the, the Jenkins build uh, pipeline plugin to, to like create this build pipeline to, to first do the, do the checkout, the build out, the test, the automated acceptance test, the performance test, and everything like that. Um, but in terms of like continuous delivery, we are just uh, about to start working out the, uh, the, the process and um, there's still uh, many things to do. Uh, so, in conclusion, um, I can say for like for the for the Plone community that we're quite quite happy with Jenkins in comparison to like Buildbot, what we what we had before. It's it's really a lot better. Jenkins provides like plugins for everything. Every time we we looked into something new like Robot Framework, uh, just look at the Jenkins uh, uh, page, and you you have a you have a, a good. Um, plugin for that, so that's really great. It has an active community, and in my opinion, it's by far the best open source uh, option that we have for CI. Um, every time I go to Python conferences, there's a and, and talk about CI or Jenkins, there's a good chance that at least one person come up to me and tell me, "Hey, I want to build a CI system in Python uh, because I, I don't like Jenkins." <laughs> and by now, I'm really tired of that because it's like it's. It's not really realistic to to like for one person to come up with like a system that is sophisticated like Jenkins, uh, and as long as nobody like really does that and can prove me that there's anything near what Jenkins can offer, uh, I won't like bother to even look. Um, as I said, our main issues have to do with scalability, like preserving the GitHub commit messages, um, making sure that you'll. Like if you get like fingerprints from from your output to to get them all in um, to present them, um, and the integration points between our Python development environment, the the environment that I described before or outlined before, like build out and uh, the tools that we are using, and keeping them in sync wi with with Jenkins. I'm not sure if if I never did like Java projects uh, with Jenkins, I'm not sure if there's a tighter integration. Like if you do a Maven job in Jenkins, if if you can tell Jenkins more information about like your development process, but in, in for Python projects, it's it 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 differs, right? And if you want to like integrate things, that's that's hard to do. Um, but that's like a tough problem, I guess. So that's not necessarily uh, Jenkins' fault. Um, yeah, that that was my talk. Um, if you want to reach me uh, on Twitter, IRC, or email, uh, uh, yeah, th this uh, those are the uh, my contact information. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to our sponsors. <laughs>